All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending our public information session on our community trail strategy. I'm Rob Axiak. I'm the Director of Community Services for the City of Welland, and I'm excited to be here tonight. We are looking forward to, to doing a little presentation for, for everyone, as well as then hearing all of your questions, comments, concerns, ideas, uh, so that we can make our community trail strategy even better. I am here tonight with both Justin and Amanda from WSP. They are consultants working on this, on this file for some time now. Uh, they have done a significant amount of work and have uh, engaged the community uh, continually throughout this process. We are now at the end of the process where we wanna hear uh, final comments uh, and ideas from the community before we bring this information forward to city council in early February. So we, we uh, look forward to hearing all your comments and I will turn this over to Justin now to run through a bit of the presentation. Thanks so much, Rob. And uh, I just wanted to say greetings to everyone and thank you all for volunteering to uh, join us on this. Uh, I'm not sure how it is where you are down in Welland. I'm up in, uh, in lovely Collingwood, Ontario and it's a, it's a beautiful winter's evening today, uh, you know, about right hovering around freezing. So uh, it's been a great, great winter's day. So I'm going to uh, just move on and we'll, we'll start with an overview of what we're gonna talk about here today. And so we're going to talk first about the foundations of the community trail strategy. We're gonna talk a little bit about the background review and how we've started to identify some of the key elements that go into the strategy. We'll talk about the facility design, talks about amenities and signage, the things that kind of go along with the physical trail. We'll talk about some of the major projects and bridge crossings that are going to be required as part of this project, some of the costing and phasing, and then finally we'll get into some of the programming and some of the, uh, the social supports that are necessary to build a truly trails-friendly community in the city of Welland. Just to give everyone a heads up, we are using Zoom webinar platform. So cameras will automatically be turned off during the meeting. You do have access to the chat functionality. Um, so you can type a comment in that. Um, my, my request to you would be that if you have a question for our project team, that you please use the question and answer tool. Um, and the Q&A function is just gonna allow us to keep better track of the questions, we can respond to them in writing and it allows us to just keep better track of those in the post meeting follow up. So we'll be able to post that Q&A. So if you have comments, if you just wanna introduce yourself, tell us who you are and where you're coming from and why you're interested in this strategy, we invite you to please use the chat to connect with fellow residents. But if you have questions specific to the project, we would invite you to please use the question and answer function. If you would like to speak, you can use the raise your hand function. Um, and if you have a, a question that you'd rather ask verbally, then you could use that raise hand function and one of our team can unmute you. Just to note that this session is being recorded and will be posted on the project website. So if you do choose to ask a question verbally, just note that you will be recorded. So I just wanna make sure that everyone is clear on that. So moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we arrived at the foundations of the plan. The community trail strategy does not exist in an island. It is set among a number of different policies and projects within the city of Welland. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we were situating it within the current and historic state of trails and policy in the city. So we were looking at the history of the city, at the trends in terms of trail design and use, at the demand for trails, at the demographics of the city, the existing policies, and of course, of the existing routes that are there within the city of Welland. And where we want to go, well, that's really us setting a vision and identifying future goals so that we can get to a place where trails are more accessible, more comfortable, more convenient, and more available to residents of the city of Welland. So I wanted to just highlight the vision that we've identified for the community trail strategy. And I also just wanna talk about how we arrived at it. So I'm gonna just start with a quick 
highlight of how we've arrived at this. So we've used those existing city documents, the planning documents. We've used a technical analysis by going through the, uh, the proposal that the city issued by identifying city leadership direction and what we've heard from senior city staff, by looking at our online engagement results, by doing stakeholder interviews, and by conducting an existing conditions assessment whereby we went out and looked at all the different trails and connections within the city. And what we arrived at for a vision for the community trail strategy is that the city of Welland aims to create a community where trails are connected, continuous, safe, accessible, well-maintained and convenient for users of all ages and abilities. On and off-road trails will provide enhanced recreation and transportation choices for visitors and residents of Welland alike, enhancing access to public space and quality of life across the city. So it's a pretty big, broad vision that really does touch on all aspects of how trails improve the quality of life across the city of Welland. But that vision, I think, is, is one of those things where, you know, it can be really hard to envision how you move forward with that. And so we wanted to identify a series of goals based on what we had heard. And so these goals were really at the heart of everything that we had done when it comes to the community trail strategy and how we are moving forward with the implementation of this strategy. So we wanted to ensure that this community trail strategy provides a guide to decision making. So it's a long range approach to developing new assets while prioritizing connections that are according to both the community need and to the fiscal capacity of the city. We want to build connectivity. We want to develop a continuous connected system of on and off road trails to connect to major destinations and to your neighboring municipalities. The importance of Welland as a trails hub in the region of Niagara cannot be understated. Its location at the center of the Greater Niagara Circle Route with the Welland Canal Trails um, is just so valuable to the city in terms of its potential to build economic development and tourism. We wanted to facilitate implementation. And by that, I mean, we wanna provide the necessary tools and resources for planning, design, implementation, maintenance, and programming. We wanna make sure that this plan includes accurate costing, a series of prioritization of projects, of investments, and the definition of roles for monitoring the, uh, the project as it moves forward. We want to develop supportive partnerships and programs and build new social infrastructure to support trails and active transportation. We want to connect with community partners to expand outreach and build new community led partnerships to bring more people to the trails. And then finally, we want to make sure that we're building equity into decision making and ensure that the trails network is equitably distributed and that the most vulnerable populations have access to the trails for both transportation and for recreation as we move forward. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and I just wanna talk about our community survey and some of the engagement that we did within the city of Welland. So we launched an online community survey and we were asking the opinions of many residents of the city of Welland in terms of how they are getting around and in terms of how they see the trails and their active transportation infrastructure through their community. We found that we got a pretty good cross section of residents. We had good representation from those older than 65 and those of working age 35 to 64, as well as younger families 19 to 34. We found that the city of Welland is a relatively multimodal community. So while 84% say that they are driving alone to get to their day to day activities, um, which does line up with what we see from the Statistics Canada information regarding mode share and commute trips. What we found is that when you dig a little deeper, you find that the community is also getting around by walking and by cycling a lot more than the Statistics Canada data would have you believe. We see this in a lot of communities in which we work, where the mode share from Statistics Canada would lead you to believe that the overwhelming majority of people are only ever getting in their car to get from point A to point B. But the reason that that discrepancy exists is that Statistics Canada data only asks about your trip to work. 
And the trip to work only represents about one in every five trips that the average person takes. So when you ask about the day-to-day -day activities and how people are getting around to get to places like the grocery store, their church, their friend's house, those types of everyday trips, you start to get a better picture of just how multimodal a community is. And that's why we see these percentages of people walking and people cycling being up quite a bit higher than you would expect based on the Statistics Canada information. The survey trends were pretty illustrative in terms of how people are using trails in the city of Welland. So about 51% of trips made by walking are made on trails and about 46% of those trips by bike are made on trails. So a lot of people are walking and cycling and using those trips without going on the trails. So that does show that there's an increased demand for a higher uh, percentage of trails around the community. And when we ask about safety, 88% uh, of people said that they felt safe or very safe walking in the city of Welland, whereas only 64% said that they felt safe cycling. So there's a fairly significant gulf between how safe people feel when they're on foot and how safe they feel when they're on their bike. One, we asked people why they were walking or cycling. We had some interesting results. For the most part, people are walking or cycling to exercise and access nature, and then to get to services in their community. For people walking, uh, one of the main responses was to walk a dog. And when it came to cycling, that response was replaced with uh, connecting with the community. I know we do often, we sometimes see people cycling with their dog, but you have to have a very energetic dog and also a very well-trained dog to go cycling with them. So we weren't really surprised to see that discrepancy there. So when it comes to the barriers identified in terms of why people aren't walking or cycling more, um, we found that a lot of these have similarities when it comes to walking or cycling. So for walking, a lack of trails or sidewalks, concern about lighting and darkness on the trails, the condition of trails and sidewalks and the way that they're maintained and potentially the, uh, you know, the kind of the pavement condition or the asphalt condition, and then intersections and road crossing safety. When it comes to cycling, uh, similar things, gaps in the cycling and trails network and uh, lack of on-road cycling facilities, intersection and road crossing safely, uh, safety, and then speed and noise of vehicle traffic. So these are, you know, I think largely consistent with what we see in other communities. And, um, you know, I think also consistent in showing that people walking and people cycling would like to see a higher degree of connectivity when it comes to their active transportation and trails network. So shifting gears again, uh, getting into the background review, I'd just like to highlight that when it comes to the community trail strategy, we are situating this within best practices and within other planning documents that exist at the local, regional, provincial, and federal level. So we are really looking to ensure that what the city of Welland has in terms of a community trail strategy aligns with best practices and prepares the city for whatever is coming in the future. So we really want to make sure that what we are recommending here aligns with best practices to set the city up for success in the future. So we looked at accepted design guidelines like the uh, Ontario Traffic Manual Book 18, which is best practice for design and implementation of cycling and trail facilities at the region of Niagara's official plan and transportation master plan, um, which provide guidance in terms of enhanced multimodal connectivity and, and additional sustainable transportation modes. Um, then we looked at the City of Welland's official plan and its Parks, Recreation and Culture Master Plan, which both highlight a transportation system which supports a variety of modes and the expansion of trails to create safe, accessible and convenient linkages to key destinations. So building on those policy backgrounds, we also looked at the accepted design guidelines. So we looked at things like the North uh, National Association of City Transportation Officials, uh, Urban Bikeway Design Guide and Urban Street Design Guide. We looked at the Ontario Traffic Manuals, Book 18 and 15 on cycling facilities and pedestrian facilities, respectively. We looked at the Transportation Association of Canada Bikeway Traffic Control Guideline for Canada. Um, we looked at the uh, um, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, 
and we looked at international guides like the um, uh, American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, just to ensure that everything that we were proposing aligned with best practices. So when it comes to the on-road facilities, um, we were looking at a number of different types of facilities when we go into recommending how the, uh, how the streets could be transformed to feel more like a trail and connect better to the trail system within the city of Welland. So we identified the features here and I'll, I'll just kind of highlight them basically from left to right along the top would be a multi-use path. So this would be something that's typically about three meters wide that would be in boulevard. So set back from the roadway, but parallel to the roadway oftentimes um, and provide movement for both people walking and people cycling in both directions. The conventional bike lanes, so these are kind of the painted bike lanes that you would typically associate as a bike lane. Um, but then we also get into some other design features like cycle tracks, which are bike lanes that are protected by a curb, so set usually at the same height as a sidewalk. Um, buffered bike lanes, which would have a little bit of a painted buffer to provide some additional separation. And then getting down into things like signed routes, um, which would provide, you know, kind of the share the road and um, and the facilities that are going to guide people in how they can get around the paved shoulders, which are more for rural treatment, and then the buffered paved shoulders, which are for rural treatment with higher volumes of traffic. So I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Amanda, and she's gonna talk a little bit about the off-road facility design and how the city of Welland is, uh, is looking to move forward with new trail standards and new trails facilities. Amanda? Hello. Uh, so in terms of off-road uh, facility de design, the updated trail classification uh, considers trail users and incorporates elements of user experience, such as ease of travel, difficulty, accessibility, trail amenities, and in addition to those typical uh, technical criteria about how the tra trail is constructed and maintained. Each trail type identifies design and management recommendations such as maintenance, lighting needs, amenity types, and frequency. So there's that consistent expectation for each trail type of what you'll see throughout the community. So we've put these uh, trail classifications into six types. And if you take a look over at the map, you'll see the, the distribution of the trails. And um, there's a nice range throughout the community. There's a lot of north-south connections. Um, however, we've got some really nice east-west and a nice distribution in terms of the types of trails. And next slide. In terms of the classifications, type one is a principal multi-use trail. So this is your premier trail. It has a bit more of a uh, tourism um, function, commuter function, uh, strong recreation. Uh, this is, you know, your Welland Canal Trail. This is your main spines, your, your community's gem of, of trails. So we're looking at fairly flat slopes, 5%, very accessible, uh, paved surface treatments for season maintenance, and really focusing on accommodating for all users. <clears throat> Type two, a road corridor trail, um, which it more associates uh, with the on-road that Justin just highlighted, but is an important part of the recreation and the off-road trail system. So similarly, these would be for season maintenance, very flat, 5%, uh, may match the road slope, so we can get a little bit steeper here. And again, accommodating all users and having that more commuter function versus a recreational uh, premier focus. And then we've got our four season multi-use trails, and these are sort of those other special gems in the community. These are hard surface mostly, and if they are um, hard, um, sorry, screening trails, they're a little better maintained to ensure there is a higher quality. Uh, still flat slopes in these trails, and we're really gearing to make sure that these are trails for everyone and that um, they're very accessible and can accommodate a lot of users. Next slide. A type, uh, type four, so the three season multi-use trail. We're getting a little bit more rugged with these trails. This is where we've got, um, you know, you've got your screening trail surfacing, three season use. So in the winter, these trails won't be winter maintained. However, it'll facilitate things like cross country skiing, snowshoeing, and those other winter season stuff that hopefully we're all experiencing right now. 
Uh, these trails may exceed 5%, uh, but still stay within the recreational trail accessibility standards of staying under 10% and really highlighting when those trails are getting steeper through signage to communicate that to participants. A type five natural trails, um, a few, not as many of these within the community, but the potential to add these in the future. And these are your more rustic trails, natural surface, uh, really responding to some of the forested areas and other areas where we don't want to pave and put in a large trail. Uh, they're meant to be more rugged and they accommodate sort of a, a smaller range of users. However, um, do hit some of the needs of and desires of some of those users who want to have that more rugged experience. And then the neighborhood greenways. And this is a really interesting sort of trail type again very road oriented but just recognizing that sometimes there isn't the ability to create a formalized trail facility and some of our neighborhoods are are quite quiet and calm and these this typology is meant to enhance these street corridors to really lead people from one point of a trail to another so characteristics within the street widening the sidewalks making sure there's sidewalks additional tree planting and signage so that way uh, we're not just directing trails users onto a piece of sidewalk infrastructure and road infrastructure to cycle, uh, we're still creating an enhanced experience. In terms of amenities, as I mentioned, each trail classification is associated with amenities and the frequency that you'll find those. Uh, in particular, um, bench seating and informal stone seating throughout the trail system. So in terms of your principal multi-use trail, you're going to see a higher frequency of those every 200 meters. So that way we can accommodate more users and provide that rest and rest refuge. In terms of your, your next, um, your type three will have the next highest level of amenities. It, um, with that hard surfacing and uh, those key connector routes, it'll have a lot of amenities as well. Uh, then your road corridor and your three season trail have a few less, more of a moderate, moderate level of amenity. So you're still going to see seating nodes just less frequently, and you may not see as much waste facilities and other types of, of infrastructure. And then natural trails progressing less and less um, amenities where we just focus on uh, seating where there's certain challenges and slopes uh, versus throughout the whole system. And neighborhood greenways, uh, we don't have a lot of amenities throughout those systems. In terms of lighting as an amenity, you're going to see those on the on the principal trails and either throughout or as nodal on those type three, four season trails. Uh, so focusing that more expensive infrastructure into key locations. The Strategy also outlines how amenities can and leveraging technology such as charge station amenities, waste sensors, and Wi-Fi. The idea is uh, there's some really unique ways to enhance user experience, promote and use, uh, and widen inclusivity throughout the trail network. Uh, these types of things can expand the traditional parameters of trail function and programming, reaching more people in meaningful ways while reducing the demand of maintenance and operational practices. And they can help to break down barriers and share experiences. So some of these can include waste and parking management through sensor tools, charge stations um, that can accommodate USB ports, uh, for phones and tablets, because you know some of our users are obsessed, we need to get them out too. And uh, also e-bikes and other rapid charge ports too help facilitate users. Wi-Fi, as much as we go, what do we need the internet for on a trail? But they can really help enable access accessibility aid devices, as well as um, engaging some of the younger users. In terms of um, mapping, thinking of interactive digital mapping, things that people can bring to the trail system and can experience the trail indoors when it's maybe not always, uh, they're, they're not always able to get out. As, and then uh, finally, user counter displays. So a way that we can inform operational maintenance while promoting the success of the trail. Wayfinding. The strategy outlines uh, wayfinding suggestions as to how and where to sign the trail. And a lot of those recommendations are really focusing, again, on enabling use. So how the signage can inform users and inform user experiences. So when someone reaches a juncture in a trail, they know what challenges lie ahead, what possible barriers can be there, and they can make informed decisions. As well, the signage can encourage fitness and other opportunities throughout the trail system. And then there's your standard safety and regulatory signage. 
throughout the strategy, overcoming barriers um, and trails for all is really a key theme. So one of the goals of the trail strategy is to provide greater access to trails and their associated cultural, historic, and natural resources to all visitors, including person with disabilities and incorporating the uh, following accessible guidelines for trails and trail facilities. Barriers are not always physical and uh, future trail design and programming needs to consider mechanisms for mitigating barriers to use. So barriers can be derived from differing, differing cognitive abilities and mental processes experienced by potential users. Barriers can be socially based and stem from issues related to income, language, race, religion, sexual orientation, health, and gender. So the strategy provides insight and tools into planning and designing trails to address these barriers for participation. Major projects. So the, the strategy outlines a couple major projects, which I'll highlight for you. One being a rail with trail. So the proposed trail um, with rail project would extend from Highway 406, crossing of the Canal and Welland River, all the way to Humberstead Road with a possible extension to Forks Road. So this, um, this would be a really unique experience because it would allow a really great connection throughout the community. So typical to these trails um, with an active rail line, you will see things such as offset distance center line from the track, um, a barrier fence that, that sort of denotes the areas of space, but still allowing people to pass back and forth, uh, crossings of the rail line because there will inevitably be trail access points and we need to do that in a safe way. And also appropriate surfacing at those tracks to accommodate cyclists. The Seaway Canal Service Road Trail is another major project. Um, both of these systems throughout um, the Seaway Service Road and Canal Service Road are actively used as either unsanctioned trails or trails that are privately owned. These existing gravel service roads uh, would require minimum trail infrastructure and require uh, and requirements for alignment and would continue to function as service for a vehicular use. They will require user agreements, but otherwise, uh, you know, a fairly simple process. But because of that coordination and organization, we have identified these as more of a long term. So they would offer the community a really great north south and then would end up um, paired with some of the other recommendations would create some really great looping systems with the well and canal trail. Pedestrian bridge crossings, um, one of my favorites. So there's there's lots of water, so we do need to get across it. And there's a couple locations that we've identified some key projects that we would like to see the city embark on. So one of those uh, being at the screen here, you see the Merritt, Merritt Island connection um, across the canal and across the Welland River. So we see this bridge uh, as being potentially a two phase project or could be done all at once, but each would provide some really meaningful connections. Uh, the, um, the canal bridge would need to be a two span bridge um, with a pier and, um, and then a smaller crossing uh, at the other location. So uh, there is another opportunity further down uh, with the twinning of the rail crossing, which we could do. And I think, yeah, Justin, if you go up to your cursor there, um, there's an existing rail bridge that could be twinned. And then that would allow a lower cost infrastructure for a bridge connection to go across and also connect to that existing landmass. So there's an opportunity there for an additional crossing or an alternate location. And then sort of a bonus uh, alternative crossing would be with the Seaway Service Road Bridge. There is an existing bridge that might offer a great opportunity to extend that network down further and could be a quick win with those trail alignments. The strategy outlines several road crossing improvements and these clearly will need to be coordinated with uh, road upgrades and bridge upgrades and a lot uh, do exist on regional roads however uh, through the strategy we want to make sure that those key areas are identified so when those opportunities come up that uh, this plan will help ensure that they are addressed in terms of um, pedestrian bridge structures 
the first um, sort of pony truss or H truss is your is your smaller bridge, something very typical that you're gonna uh, that we're recommending for those shorter crossings. For your larger crossings, uh, the community will have options to go with a larger box truss that you'll see in the in the center image. Uh, so larger structure bridges, and then there's always the option to do more of a signature custom bridge. So if the community really wants to uh, to set a mark and really make a destination, uh, that's an option as well. And and obviously each one of these comes at an escalating cost, but there are several um, options that uh, some of these bridge crossings could be very economical and could also become a really great community feature. Now, in All terms right. of the, yeah, in terms of the phasing, I guess I'll just kind of mention um, this particular one that's got our, our off-road trails. So as you can see, uh, short term is the green. These are really quick wins. So these are projects that we've identified that we think would have a really great impact and would be really easy, really quick to implement and, and would have um, an instant an instant joy to the trail system. Uh, the yellow is the medium term. Uh, these uh, projects we think would require a little more time to plan, however, would be really key um, to, to get in, in the near future. And then the long term projects uh, in red, those are projects that either are linked with future land development or maybe not as critical to the system, or they might um, take longer to plan and to organize. Mm -hmm. And I, I do just want to emphasize, Amanda, uh, that the the costing here, I know that there's those are some some big numbers to look at. Um, and I just want to emphasize that the, the reason why we do these types of strategies and the reason why we lay out these costs for municipalities is not so much to be a prescriptive tool to say, here's how much you have to spend on trails, go and raise taxes to pay for it. But what they do is they allow the city to say to, to funders, so whether that's higher orders of government or when they're adjusting their development charges by law as new development is being constructed and you're wanting to build new trails to accommodate growth, um, they provide the foundation in policy for the city to be able to seek those funds. So these are the kinds of costs that would be borne not through the addition of new taxes on the city of Welland, although you know that may be something that is considered in the future if you want to accelerate the implementation of some of these high priority trails, but they would be considered with you know seeking new funding, whether it's through the gas tax fund, through the federal active transportation fund, the $400 million that's being rolled out by the feds to support active transportation through a development charges bylaw review where you're starting to look at, you know, what elements of community building are being paid by new development within the community because we do know that there's a significant amount of growth expected within the city of Welland in the coming years. And so we want to ensure that as that new growth comes online, that the entire community benefits from that growth and from the investment that's happening within the community. And if you don't have a plan in place and you can't point to an approved policy, then it's really hard to go ahead and secure that funding from the development community or from the other levels of government. So I just wanted to highlight that when we're looking at this and just contextualize those costs as we move forward. So we are almost done. I do just want to, I, I recognize that there's a, a hand up in the, in the chat and we will get to you, I promise. Um, we're almost done. We have three slides left. So we'll just wrap it up and then we'll move on into the Q&A and we'll be able to answer your questions. And we're really excited to, uh, to hear what you guys think about these, uh, about these recommendations. So the next piece we wanted to talk about was the on-road facilities. So we did identify on-road routes as part of the community trail strategy. We reviewed them with the antenna supporting the off-road trails. Um, so while we categorized the routes to either high priority or low priority, um, we didn't go into the same level of detail in terms of the phasing and costing as we did with the trails themselves. We expect that these are gonna be reviewed 
revised and updated as the city undertakes a transportation plan in the near future. And that'll ensure that the current road conditions and planned roadway construction projects are considered as those elements are moved forward. Because one of the things that we know from our experience is that uh, standalone cycling projects on the roads are much more difficult to install uh, and much more costly than doing them in association with a reconstruction or a resurfacing project. So the more that you can uh, coordinate your capital works, the better you're going to be able to control those costs and deliver those projects in a cost-effective manner. Um, so we do recognize that that this is, you know, probably a topic that's best discussed in the transportation plan moving forward. So. Uh, I wanted to just wrap up with a quick discussion of the recommended programming uh, for the city of Welland to support the trails strategy as it moves forward. We always like to include this in the plans that we're writing. Um, and the reason behind this is that, you know, there, there's the old adage, if you build it, they will come. And that holds true to a point. Um, but for the same reason that you wouldn't want to see your community go out and build a brand new swimming pool at the cost of millions of dollars, and then when it comes time to staff it with lifeguards and offer swimming lessons, they just decide to take a pass on it. Um, you don't want to go out and build new trails and active transportation infrastructure and neglect to surround it with supportive community events and programming. These are the kinds of things that bring people to the trails and the active transportation infrastructure that start to build support for it and that can really make a difference in terms of the culture of mobility within a community. So one of the things that we are recommending would be the bringing back of the Welland Active Transportation Advisory Committee and the provision of annual discretionary funding so that that committee can do things like run events, install small scale infrastructure projects, you know, whether that's bike repair stands, benches, um, uh, oh, I had another one in the back of my mind, but I just lost it. Uh, so, uh, you know, whether it's parking, bike parking, shelters, mapping, signage, those kinds of things. Um, family bike and trail days, you know, giving people an opportunity to bring their kids out, maybe organizing a bike swap on the trail where people can bring the bikes that their kids have outgrown, trade them in for the next size up and, and you know, let the, let the younger kids get the, the new bikes as they come in. Looking at routine community walk and bike events, hosting bike valet events at community uh, community celebrations so that kind of operates almost like a uh, like a coat check for your bike so you show up you check your bike in you get a little tag at the end of the event you hand your tag in at the staff booth grab your bike and away you go it raises the visibility and uh, and value of of active transportation to those events Hosting a bike and trails month, providing a series of different events through the span of a month to really kind of build that momentum around active transportation and trails use. Developing some downtown bike corrals, so replacing potentially a parking spot or two in the downtown with uh, space to park eight to 10 bikes uh, would definitely improve the visibility of bike parking and then also provide that kind of safe, secure bike parking downtown. It was an identified gap. And looking at supporting the active school travel programming within the region of Niagara, providing some support for small scale infrastructure investments, providing staffing support, and making sure that the, uh, the active school travel program, which is a proven countermeasure to get more kids to walk or bike to school, um, can be implemented effectively in Welland, where a lot of those schools are still very walkable and bikeable. And then as you move forward through those, those first batch of programs, those are kind of like what I would call the beginner programs. And then you can start to move on into like the advanced programs and looking at doing a higher degree of data collection and reporting, um, and then looking at cycling, walking and trails promotion, and potentially looking at doing a bike share and micro mobility feasibility study possibly in partnership with some of your neighboring municipalities, whether that's the city of Thorold, the city of Niagara Falls, um, looking to what's already going on in, uh, in Niagara on the lake, 
the Zoom bike share system that's being offered there. There's plenty of different options available nowadays on the market that were not there even as few as five years ago when it comes to micro mobility and bike share systems. So those would be the kinds of things that would require more than just the funding. These types of things require staffing support. And so they require the city to begin to think about hiring a trails coordinator, to think about delivering uh, additional support to the Active Transportation Advisory Committee in the form of staffing support, and to be starting to move forward um, with a whole bunch of different programs where they're doing outreach and keeping the idea of cycling and active transportation and trails use front and center within the community. And with that, we will move on into the Q&A part of the session. And we will say thank you to all of you for attending this evening. Um, we recognize that, you know, it's seven o'clock on a, is it Thursday? I don't know, it's, it's seven o'clock on a blur's day night. Uh, it feels like every day's blur's day nowadays, um, especially if you're a parent of young kids like me. Um, so, uh, but we really appreciate you being here uh, in participating in our open house. And, uh, and so we'll move on to questions. So I do just wanna answer the questions that have come in through the Q&A. So there was one question that came in uh, that I answered in the in the Q&A function. And it was just, if runners were considered pedestrians in the survey data, and if they were also identifying feeling safe. Um, and I'll just highlight for those that are watching the recording that we didn't have the ability to differentiate between runners and, and walkers, but there were a lot of runners who did indicate that they you know, primarily use the trails for running. And their responses in terms of their feelings of safety were consistent with people uh, on the whole. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go to our I'm going to go to the hands up, and then we can uh, we'll respond to the questions in the chat uh, in a moment. So why don't we go to uh, we'll go to Carol first. So Carol, I'm going to allow you to talk here. You should be able to unmute yourself now, Carol. Okay, can you hear me now? We can indeed. Yes. Okay. Um... Oh, and then I see a, a note coming in from James Takeo. He and I are both on the uh, Waterway Advisory Committee, which is uh, how we learned of, of today's webinar. And glad to be part of it. It sounds very, very interesting. Uh, I'm also chair of the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. So from that point of view, uh, I'm interested to know the extent to which you have delineated age groups in your studies. Your, you know, 46% walk and so on and so forth. Um, because of course that's uh, our committee's uh, uh, focal point. But um, before you answer, I wanted to uh, just say that the committee, the Seniors Advisory Committee, has in fact been addressing some of the issues that, that you're raising tonight, which are signage. And, and we have a project underway called Let's Chat Benches. Yeah, you may have heard of it because it's kind of, uh, you know, throughout the country. Anyway, so we have a couple of them coming up. We've worked with the city. And so, you know, COVID uh, will end some point so hopefully we can put, put those uh, into action so it just seemed to me that um, we're a really good um, partnership without even knowing it you know because we have similar goals and I think it's great you know perhaps you could come and speak to my committee uh, perhaps I should have let them all know they some of them might have enjoyed this but in any event that's all I have to say Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, the recording will be available, so you can definitely share it with your committee members. And I would encourage you as this moves towards being completed and, and being adopted by council, I would definitely encourage you to, uh, to reach out to Rob, who's on the call from the city side, 
and uh, and you know he would be a great person to come and and speak to the uh, the waterway advisory committee about how you can better uh, integrate between the waterway and the uh, the trail strategy. So thank you so much for your feedback and yeah the uh, the let's talk benches I think are just such a wonderful um, a wonderful initiative to really support that type of community connectivity that uh, that we've all been desperately lacking. They're so interesting. You know, there was one little video that you might have seen where um, an elderly gentleman was sitting on a bench and uh, a young man uh, came along and sat down and they got chatting. And uh, the, uh, the senior person was asking the young man to describe, uh, there, there were some voices and, and he was asked to describe what was taking place. And uh, a few more questions on that point, and you realize that the elderly gentleman was blind. And so he was uh, asking to have the younger man, you know, so in, engage with him and bring the world that he could see into his world. I mean, it was such a beautiful, beautiful uh, example of how those Let's Chat benches could work. So we're, we're really hoping, you know, we get a chance to enlarge on those. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, we're gonna move on to, uh, to David. So David, I'm gonna allow you to speak. You should be able to unmute yourself now, David. Okay, hi, Justin, can you hear me? We can, yes. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for giving us this opportunity to you know, become aware of uh, of these trail strategy and what to, where Welland's going here. In my particular situation, um, I live in the Hunters Point community, which is, as you probably know, where the Welland Recreational Trail intersects with the actual, uh, sorry, the Welland Recreational Canal intersects with the canal and the Welland River. So we're in that property, um, boarding along the, bordering along the Welland community. Uh, sorry, the Welland River. I just wanted you to know that we are also looking at ways of, uh, uh, in concert with the Seaway Authority, if, if they're amenable, to establish a trail that would help our residents who are mostly um, 60, 60 to, and over, I suppose, and mostly very active, to allow them to use a trail and to reconnect or to connect with the Welland Trail system. So just so you know, we're also uh, interested in, in, in this work. And if you, you know, need to contact us, uh, I would be the person to, uh, to contact. And our developer is also very uh, keenly interested in, in, this, uh, in this program. Fantastic. That's wonderful. Thank you, David. We appreciate that. And yeah, we, we did hear from quite a few folks in the, uh, in the Hunter's Point area about the importance of, uh, of building stronger connections to the, you know, to the other amenities within the city from that, uh, from that community. So thank you very much. Um, we'll go to, uh, we'll go to Harold next. Okay, Harold, you should be able to unmute. I, can you hear me now? There Justin? you go. Yep. We I'm, got uh, Harold Sachuk. And um, when uh, Wellen had the uh, advice, mayor's advisory committee for active transportation, I was the chair of that group for three to four years until the, the group kind of disappeared. Um, and I've got a, a, a 30 year old background in, in active and safe routes to school programs, both locally, provincially, and nationally. And so my concern is that uh, that uh, children be uh, included in this overall program. I realize this is a trails program, but it's an active trans transportation program too. And when, when I worked with the uh, the advisory committee for active transportation for Welland, uh, certainly one of our major concerns was the connectivity between trails and sidewalks, and between sidewalks and missing links of sidewalks and whatnot. And if we're going to encourage our children to, uh, to be active in their transportation to school, walking, cycling, um, uh, there needs to be that, that connectivity. And, and part of that concern was, and I didn't hear any 
any of this here today uh, is the speed of the traffic along those bike lanes and 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 in communities, school communities. And so uh, I was delighted to see that uh, active transportation to school was was considered there as a as a one of the valuable programs. And I was delighted to hear that there was some recognition of that and and support for that. Uh, so what I would add to the mix here is that we need, I think, uh, to consider the uh, missing links of sidewalks and the missing links of bike trails on our streets for the sake of that population, uh, those children from 5 to 20 with the Niagara College, uh, there's a great need in the market there for active transportation to their schools. Uh, I understand that that active transportation includes walking to work, walking for recreation and walking for fitness, et cetera, et cetera, active healthy living through active transportation. So uh, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that uh, you recognize the the uh, safe roads to school is should be a valuable part of that. So I would add those concerns to this whole this whole document if if uh, going forward. Thank you for that. Just just to let you know, I almost missed this meeting because uh, I'm in southern Arizona right now, and there was a <laughs> time difference. And I I thought there was a three hour time difference, but then when the clocks changed a month or so ago, it suddenly dawned on me. Oh no, it's only a two hour difference. So here <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just looking at about six p.m. and and I am getting hungry. <laughs> well, we're we're glad that you were able to make it, and uh, we won't hold you back too much more from dinner there, Harold. <laughs> um, you know, one of the one of the challenges I think of, of, a, of an open house like this is that we really can't present everything that we did. You know, this was a more than a year long study um, where we did quite a bit of mapping and background review. And that included analyzing all of the different community destinations. And key among those was the location of schools and the identification of, of those gaps that were existing along the route to those schools. So I did just want to highlight that, you know, we, we really, in every active transportation and trail strategy that we perform, you know, we see schools as a key trip generator and a place that we really want to focus our investments on building all ages and abilities infrastructure to ensure that children can get to school safely and actively, because we know the benefits of that are just so myriad that it just cannot be ignored. I do wanna answer a few of the questions that came up in the Q&A before we go back to the live. So uh, Sharmila and Dawn, we will get to you in a moment. And I was gonna say, Justin, there's also in the chat some really good points and questions. So um, yeah. we should sneak in there too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the questions that, that came in and I'll just kind of respond to some of the quick and easy ones first. So we had a question about how will the funds be raised um, so primarily, we'd be looking at, you know, development charges um, at external funding sources like the Federal Active Transportation Fund, or by just using uh, the city's general capital budget. Um, the ideal would be to leverage the capital budget to, to secure additional funding. So typically, when you're talking about sustainable transportation or trails projects, you are often looking at abilities to, to secure matching funding from higher orders of government. So we would definitely encourage the city to uh, to leverage their money so that it goes a little further, right? It, it's always a lot better if you can spend a dollar and get three out of, uh, you know, out of your funding partners, then those are the kinds of things you want to do. There was a question here about, uh, will there be consideration for public transit along with these trail plans? For example, bus stops near trail access. So when we did our, our original mapping, we were looking at the, uh, at the transit routes within the city of Welland. So while it would absolutely be appropriate for the transportation plan to consider how to move public transit uh, or bus stops near trail access, um, it would be beyond the scope of this plan to recommend moving bus stops to be closer to trails, but it is definitely within the scope of this plan for us to recommend where trails can be closer to existing bus stops or bus routes. And we have done that um, in, in our mapping to, to help identify the priorities. To expand on what types of, there's a question here, can you expand on what types of things can be done to improve active school transportation? Um, there is an entire program called Ontario Active School Travel that's run by Green Communities Canada that is a proven effective tool 
that moves essentially right from planning to implementation and monitoring and then restarting that process. So it involves things like, um, you know, reviewing routes, doing mapping, understanding infrastructure needs, um, as well as doing programming and providing support for students, for parents, for teachers, and for administrators. So it's a it's a really comprehensive program that would be challenging for me to try and sum up in just one response. But just to say that it is a it is a a well studied, um, well known, and uh, and certainly evidence backed um, program that's delivered. Uh, here all across Ontario in different communities. And you do have a strong existing delivery partner within the region of Niagara through Niagara Public Health that is already delivering school travel planning pro projects all across the region. Uh, there was a question that I typed an answer for. I, I don't know if it's exactly the most detailed, but there was a question about the, um, the Main Street and Division Street bridges, the kind of those crossings. Um, and those were definitely a priority that emerged. Um, those very confusing, very challenging crossings. Um, so identifying signage uh, and the potential for infrastructure enhancements along those corridors is all in kind of the high priority bucket um, for this project. So we really wanna see those, those gaps get filled. Um, and then the other part of that question was a consideration about including signage downtown to show trail directions and route, but also signage to inform trail users if nearby amenities and businesses are around. Um, and that is, something that we consider to be a best practice when it comes to our signage is that you want to direct people towards those amenities. Um, and so leveraging a partnership with the BIA could be a really great way to do that. Um, I can try to tackle Kathy's question. I was going to share my screen, sure. but I'm not sure if I'm allowed. <laughs> uh, you should be able. It says I'm blocked. <laughs> oh, are you? Okay, give me half a minute here, Amanda. I'll, I'll make you a co-host and you should be able to. <laughs> Uh, no problem. And while we're doing that, uh, maybe um, Margaret had a question here, Rob, and, it, and it's awful because I've been relying on our own maps for, for a while now. <laughs> is there, um, what's the location in terms of, the question, is there anywhere that residents of Welland can find a map where the trails are, how to access, and how long they are? Yeah, thanks for that question. So uh, we are, there are some, I would suggest a few outdated ones. Um, I do think, uh, I do know that we are actually starting to try to put one together, so it is very clear. Uh, there are some very kind of creative apps that are out there right now that, that do talk about different trail systems throughout the province as well. Um, so we're exploring what that could, could potentially look like, so it's a bit more of an automated piece. And back to you, Amanda. Yeah, am I sharing, what screen? Am I sharing a map? Uh, I see a black green with a line, but maybe other yep. people see different. <laughs> no, let me try again. I'm sorry. Oh, yep. Any better? Uh, nope. Still a black screen with a line. Let's try again. It, <laughs> oh, here we go. No, it's, it's giving me a, it's not liking this. I'm going to try one more time. Oh, there, there we is. go. Oh, there, there it is. Okay, I just yeah. <laughs> moved it around. Okay, so the question was about, and this is something that I know internally we had a lot of talks about, this whole Woodlawn and up to and um, uh, Daimler Road, this one here. Mm -hmm. um, so just questions about access and connection. So Woodlawn Road is a regional road. So that's one of the reasons why you don't see us identifying any infrastructure because there are different plans for that. And because it was outside of Welland's purview, uh, we tried to make the, the system independent of that. Uh, so there may be some future, um, and I don't know if Justin knows exactly what their plans are, but there may be some future uh, infrastructure upgrades for that portion. Now in here, we looked at that certainly as an option because there is some existing sidewalks that go so far, but instead we took the proposed trail sort of around uh, the outskirts and hugged it to the waterways. 
um, and, and then facilitated some connections that way. Uh, any thoughts on, and it was, and it was Kathy, uh, on this? And, and should we be looking at this instead? Um, I don't know if, if you if you want to join us to chat, um, because uh, yeah, we, we tried to kind of work around that and facilitate that connection, and maybe not in the most direct way, but we tried to make it uh, a scenic way. Here, hang on, I'll just see if I can. Amanda, if you can still hear me, like yep. David Snook, oh, yeah, uh, I'm a resident of Hunters Point as well. And, uh, and we do have a sidewalk connection out of Long Daimler to Woodlawn, but there's about 100 meters missing where our cyclists mm -hmm. and our, oh, our okay. pedestrians have to walk on the roadway. Actually, it's the off ramp or the Is ramp right here? coming yep. off of 406. Yeah. And it's a, it's a nightmare, not only the speed, but just the fact that there is really, really just a blank section there of about 100 meters. And I when, when we worked with the uh, Active Transportation Advisory Committee, uh, it took us some three years of almost down on our knees begging with the region, with the uh, smart center and with the city to try and find someone to address that connection. And that's what I meant when I talked about connectivity of sidewalks and trails okay. and whatnot. Very good. So let's, yeah, we'll just mark that and take another look to see, you know, again, there's those different uh, regional versus municipal jurisdictions, but um let's see what we can do we'll take another look at this area because it is i mean looking at the map it, it is a gap and 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 again we did look at this and then and then looked at alternatives around um but certainly the team can revisit this for sure i know the citizens who live in uh, in hunters point uh, uh to access the smart center mall there is is downright dangerous <laughs> yeah and i mean you know i'm hoping to get this trail around but that might be a little bit of a longer journey it's certainly more direct to go right through so yeah let's let's let the team take that away and see if there's something that we can do that's a little bit more direct thank you for Good. recognizing that um i'd like to go to uh to Sharmila. Am I Thanks. pronouncing your name correctly? It's uh, Sharmila. Thank you very much. Sharmila, thank okay. Uh, you know, thank you for the session. So I, I'm living uh, pretty much towards uh, Bridge 13 there. So it's great to hear about some of the, some of the connectivity, especially around uh, the trail towards Lincoln there and uh, being able to get to the, the waterway um, for swimming. And I see a lot of kids using that. And although there is the street light, you know, it's not really a natural a natural path there to go. So I don't know what's possible with the current infrastructure, uh, but I digress because that's not my two points that I wanted to raise. So my two points that I wanted to raise and, and one of them I already put into the chat is around uh, Washington facilities. And so as you were mentioning in the beginning around the foundational documents, um, you know, thinking about accessibility and aging in place, you know, you really can only go as far as your bladder can take you. So, you know, thinking about where are those natural connections where people can access the bathroom, and how that can be, um, you know, identified in whatever app is going to be created for people to access trails. Um, and then also a consideration when it was mentioned about user experience and where you can have fruit trees growing along these areas for people to have uh, their own experiences. Uh, and I'll just share because there is a fruit tree near the church there, near the bridge. And so I think it's crab apples or whatever. Uh, so I had my niece and nephew and, and you know, and we went there and we were just trying to pick them up uh, and there was no, none really left on the lower branches, but uh, a stranger stopped who was taller and helped us to get some off the top branches, you know, and so it allowed for a, a natural kind of interaction and, and people were enjoying themselves there. So, you know, just, just some points of consideration and sorry, there was a third one and I forgot. And the third piece is just, you know, and, and maybe it's in these plants, I don't know, but I would like to hear something about reconciliation. Uh, what are we looking at for an indigenous trail? You know, what is the community saying? Or will they be engaged or have they been engaged, uh, et cetera? Thank you. Perfect, and fruit trees, love it. And it's something that I keep sneaking into projects. So I will gladly add that uh, wording in here because I, I think it's fantastic. It can be, an operations person's worst nightmare sometimes, but uh, I think uh, we've been positioning fruit trees into more naturalized landscapes and then it alleviates some of those concerns with mowing. Um, uh, washrooms, and that is another, and I think in terms of that app locator, it's not necessarily, I mean, there's certain things that Welling can do to add that infrastructure, but also linking uh, trail users to nearby public washrooms. So I, I definitely, we're gonna work that in there. It's not something we have mentioned right now, but it's something that we can advise on. Yeah, in terms of the uh, 
in terms of indigenous reconciliation and, and how the trails can better reflect the uh, the history of the land that we all walk on. I, I do think that there is um, that there's a need for for these types of strategies to to take those uh, types of things into account. We we did reach out to the First Nations within Niagara region as we were developing this strategy, and um, oftentimes I think what ends up occurring is that there is just there is so much that comes across the the plates of those organizations and and they're just limited in their resources to respond to everything and we unfortunately did not hear back on this project and we really would like to ensure that moving forward that there's a strong relationship built between the city and the indigenous communities of Niagara region so that um, you know the trails can reflect the, the history of the place and begin to be a, a truth telling venue um, as the city moves forward. As I mentioned, you know, I live here in the, uh, in the town of Collingwood and I, I really encourage, um, you know, all the, uh, all the folks that are on this call to look up the, uh, the gathering circle in the city or in the town of Collingwood, um, take a look at, at what was done to construct that project. It was, uh, it was constructed in 2019 and it is a really, um, it's a really special place in my community. Uh, it lies right along the trail um, and it's a key amenity. It's a place where we have a great many joyful gatherings um, where there are uh, cultural celebrations where people can learn the history of the land but it also became a, a space for mourning, um, you know, with the discovery at the Kamloops and the, it was the first place where people went um, as, a, as a place for community mourning. And I just think that those types of public spaces are really special and really sacred. And, and when you create those types of opportunities, um, I think that you can start the, the process of reconciliation in a more meaningful way. And you can't do the process of reconciliation in a private space. It needs to be in a space that is public, that is accessible and that is visible. And that is where those trails are just such an important asset. Um, so thank you for that comment. And uh, you know, I think it's, it's definitely something for the city to consider moving forward. Um, I do want to just recognize the time. We are past our eight o'clock, but we are happy to hang out and answer questions. But I just want to, you know, if people who are here need to drop off, like there's no pressure, no stress, we're going to post this recording and you can watch it at a more civilized hour if you're, uh, if you're looking to go and, you know, watch your Netflix or do whatever. I mean, it's not like anyone's got anywhere. You know, it's not like people are going out. So, um, but anyways, uh, so why don't we why don't we move through some more of these conversations uh, with the folks in the chat and maybe Dawn, would you like to uh, to speak up? We've un I've given you permission to unmute there. Thanks, Justin. Gotcha. Uh, thank, you very much, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my my name is uh, Dawn Kent Elliott. I am a active cyclist, four season cyclist. So uh, where you commented about getting the Cross country skis out. I think uh, it's time for the fat bikes to be out uh, because I, I do have a, a bike for each season. Uh, what I would like to comment about is, uh, and thank you, Amanda, for keeping this map up. Uh, down towards Hunter's Point, and, and possibly David might uh, have some input here, uh, there is a train bridge, uh, and it might be worth consideration if something could be done so that train bridge connects to the um, Welland Canal, the circle route, uh, more down towards uh, Hunter's Point. Okay. We're going to Dane City. Oh, this one here. No, yeah. no, no, that's that's the other way. Go north. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we don't have a bridge in Dane City anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't go there. That was Monday night. Because there's, um, there's the existing one. Um, no, nope, keep going. Keep going. Then... Right at the very, very end. David, can you? Right there. Keep going. Yep. This yeah. one here? You're almost there. there right there. Yeah, it's just on, on the other side of the 406 highway. It's a yeah. railway bridge. Yeah, it is. It is a railway bridge. We use that um, in the Lake to Lake mountain bike race. Mm -hmm. um, the lake was, was in existence. And it, it, it was also great 
uh, prevented you from having to use, you know, I won't use Woodlawn to connect over to the pathway. I would have to uh, go through town and that, we, we have such an amazing, um, the, the circle route is, is absolutely wonderful and let's connect if we can. So I, I just mentioned that, that rail. Yeah, so the report includes a recommendation um, for this one as well. So it would Perfect. be the land outcrop that comes through here where the rail bridge is on. We'd be able to install um, essentially a retaining wall and 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 this would be just sort of a, a more highly constructed trail structure. Um, it's, it's just off this map. and I think we've added it to other maps because it's slightly outside of jurisdiction, but it's still there. And then this side, um, it, it could be a twinning of that rail bridge um, or repurposed if, if, if rail traffic does cease. And then it would create this really great network, not only with creating loops here, but then with the railway trail, um, creating sort of this whole system where you could essentially start to do mm -hmm. some really great loops through the space. It would be, it would be fabulous. Thank you uh, for that consideration. Uh, with respect to uh, the mapping that was questioned, uh, I've been very active on uh, a, an app called Trail Forks. Um, we have mapped a lot of the trails down along the 12 Mile Creek area uh, in St. Catharines. There are a couple that are mapped in Welland uh, already that are mapped that we use on a regular basis. So, so the Trail Forks uh, app, if anybody has, has you know, an opportunity to look there or, or use that. And you can add um, to that as a user. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Don. Um, I see Paul, I will, uh, give you permission there. You should be good, Paul. Yes. Are you okay? Can you hear me? We gotcha. Thanks again for all the work you've done. In a previous consultation, public, uh, consultation, we talked about the extension of the Merritt Island trail all the way over to the main canal. I know it's outside the jurisdiction but I think that should be a strong recommendation because there's an existing uh, bridge there that takes you onto the canal road and takes you all the way down to Dane City. I know there's gonna be a large build in Dane City. And to me, that would be a very quick win. And on a previous map, I think you showed the canal road as being a low probability possibility oh um, just just a longer phase in terms of the um uh, longer term phase uh, in terms of priority so um but yes uh, you know should we be uh, elevating that because it's easier it is easier <laughs> yeah i'm not sure why that would be longer term phase if you could simply get approval from the canal authority it could be started tomorrow mm -hmm. it exists the road is there yeah, I, the more I look at this too, I think I think that potentially the rail with trail is probably a harder project um, and maybe should go to the longer term versus the medium term and maybe we could flip that. Um, because, um, you know, we wanted to make sure we didn't, I mean, I would have put everything in the immediate term, but no one would <laughs> let me. So <laughs> we had to allocate something. But I think, you know, in, in the more I look at this, that potentially, you know, let, you know, let's look at Justin, maybe we flip out some of these and, um, and try to get at least one of these sides as Mars proprietor, because you're right, it, it, it's a pretty low cost. It's just more the coordination. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes, and we do need to just, I just, I just need to draw it in here. Now I think this map, sorry, I think I had a couple older maps, but this map shows this better and I, I should just, just draw away. <laughs> yeah, did, did we, did we clarify who owns that land? No, but I'll, I'll write it down again and, and that's, I'll make sure I get that homework assignment done. Because there is a rough path there now, but it there would is. need to be paved to come over that bridge. Thank you. Yeah. So I did go through and, and answer all the questions in the Q&A, um, and I just want to let folks know if you're watching the recording that we will, uh, we've, we've posted the, uh, the Q&A um, in the 
that'll be posted on the project website. So you'll be able to see the responses. So I don't want to go through and read all of them out, uh, given that we're already 15 minutes over our time. So I do want to just be cognizant of that respectful of, uh, of what we said we were going to do, but this has just been a, a wonderful conversation. And so I didn't want to cut it off. Um, but I think uh, knowing that the, the questions are all um, coming in and I, yeah, I definitely, um, you know, we're, we're seeing the, the comments in the chat and I just want to let everyone know that if you're, you know, if you're commenting in the chat and you'd like to be involved in some way as this moves forward, um, you know, we'll have your email and we'll make sure that you are included, um, you know, potentially in that list of people that would be contacted as the city moves forward with implementation and is, uh, and is looking at, you know, whether they're recruiting for the Active Transportation Advisory Committee or those kinds of things. Um, we think that uh, we think that this is really great. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to pass it over to Rob for our final words, and uh, and we'll close up the evening. Um, I just want to say thank you to all those who attended for your generosity with your time and your insights. Um, this has been a really valuable discussion, and we're really thankful for so many people being engaged. Rob, thanks, Justin. And this this was definitely an incredible evening of so many different. Uh, conversations, ideas, concepts, really very thoughtful uh, information that was provided by, by so many people in the community. So I do want to thank you for all of that. We were, uh, uh, this was a second session that we were just hosting. And I'm so glad that we did because we, I think we got even more information out of this particular session and ideas, such create creative ideas. So Thank you very much for this. We will make sure we capture all of this information. Our goal is to bring this to council in early February um, so that they can endorse and, ad and adopt uh, this uh, community trail strategy. Uh, and I do hope to wrap all your, your, your great ideas into that conversation. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and I look forward to uh, uh, posting this and getting this uh, all approved in the very near future. Thank you again.